but the miners aren't going to be producing much more silver. You know, we need much, much higher silver prices. We need triple digit silver in order to incentivize the miners to start mining more metal because at these current prices, there's just not enough money into it and not enough margin, pardon me. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira, part of the outreach team of Silver Bullion here in Singapore, where we want to help you truly secure your wealth. Keith Newmeyer joins us today. Keith was the original and founding president of First Quantum Minerals. He later went on and founded First Majestic Silver in 2002, as well as First Mining Gold in 2015. And Keith knows the ins and outs, the ups and downs of the mining industry with insights that can help precious metals investors. And we're delighted to have Keith join us once again today. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Keith Newmeyer. Keith, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? Uh, great, Patrick. It's been uh, too long uh, since we talked last. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been too long. So we, we got to shorten up the distances be, between interviews here. First question here. Metals have been on the move, gold clearing 2100 per ounce, silver clearing 24 per ounce, platinum even clearing 900 an ounce. What's your take on why the upward move for metals? Well, I am a little bit shocked on how quickly gold has moved. Um, not that I'm shocked at the price. I, I think gold prices should be much higher and silver. But uh, nevertheless, you know, it's a pretty substantial move in a short period of time. And whenever I see moves like that, I always get a little bit nervous and you know, I'd rather see, you know, slower, more, you know, plot, you know, uh, smaller moves on a daily basis. But look, I'll take it. Uh, you know, we're a mining company. We produce gold. We produce a lot of gold. So, you know, we sold some gold uh, today at 2150, uh, which is the highest sale we've ever made in the 20 year history of the company. So it's nice to be, uh, you know, selling our, our metal at uh, these prices. Yeah, I hear you. A lot of uh, people in the metals industry pretty happy right now. And the Fed, uh, Fed is poised, or so they say, that rate cuts will happen this year. People are considering maybe even March. And once the Fed starts to cut rates, do you think these rate cuts might even be more of a catalyst, an even bigger uh, move that could happen for, for the metals once they see confirmation with the price movement upwards? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, um, <clears throat> you know it's almost the same as Bitcoin. You know, when the, the, all, all the chat around, uh, you know, um, the e, the new ETF coming out and, you know, Bitcoin rallied and uh, got up to over, you know, I think about 68,000 in that range, I think it was. And then then when the ETF came out, it, it dropped, you know, down to, you know, I think it was 58,000. And then it's now regained that um, that momentum. Um, uh, so it's almost like it was, you know, buy on rumor, sell on news. Um, you know, look, I'm a $3,000 gold guy. Um, it doesn't really matter what the Fed does to rates, in my view. If if they don't cut or if they do cut, you know, sure, it's going to move gold either way. But these are all short-term moves anyways. And uh, gold will be a lot higher uh, over the next few years and uh, silver prices as well. So I've got very little concern for what the Fed does. Yeah, great point. Great point on the, uh, the short upward movement or quick upward movement. Uh, you know, sentiment is that silver's positive fundamentals should encourage decent bargain hunting. And and I saw an interview where you had mentioned young people, even family offices are showing up at, at conferences. And you mentioned that in the 35 years or so that you've been in business and seeing the same people over and over again at these conferences, you are seeing new people in the market and, and they are kicking the tires when it comes to, to silver. What do you think is drawing in this this market to silver? Yeah, it's quite interesting, and that's why I brought it up because I, you know, I don't know. And then, uh, you know, these young, I, I just I just came back from the PDAC, and uh, um, you know, we have our you know our annual event there. You know, uh, we had about thirteen hundred people show up, and uh, there's one fellow from Germany who, who came up to me, and uh, he came up to me in Switzerland as well. Uh, back in November, and he, I spent about 30 minutes with him. Quite a young guy. He looks like he's 20 years old. He's probably a little bit older than that, but but uh, he looks quite young. And uh, um, uh, he flew all the way to Toronto uh, to come to our event. Um, I, first time in Canada, uh, and I don't know where the heck his money's coming from. Uh, and I asked him when he's flying home. He says, I have no return 
flight yet because I want to cross Canada. I want to see the country. I've heard the good things about it. And so I gave him some advice on where to go and so on and so forth. And this guy's obviously made some money somewhere, whether it's his family money or whether it's Bitcoin money. I have no idea. But uh, young people are, are are definitely coming into this business, into this market and and, and buying stock in, in, in mining companies. So it's pretty intriguing because, as you say, you know, I've seen the same faces time and time again. It's really refreshing. I, I first noticed it in London last um, uh, November. And I've I've seen it a couple of times now, the different conferences that I attend. It seems like we may see more of these younger people come in. It seems mm -hmm. we may see more of the, the wealthy, the family offices come in, or at least start kicking the tires, as, as you said. But ultimately, what do you think it's going to take for them to pull the trigger and really start to heavily invest in either the mines or the metal itself? You know, it's all momentum. And, uh, you know, I get asked this question quite regularly. And, uh, you know, what's the catalyst? And, and uh, you, you know, it's all headlines. It's all money flows. That's all it is. It's got, uh, you know, you can, I think you can, can, can compare. And you, I'm not sure if uh, you've seen some of my previous interviews. I gather you have. But um, I'll just repeat myself for your audience. Um, I, I look at today's act, market activity very similar to what happened in 2000. You know, the Nasdaq peaked out at 5,000 in March of 2000. And uh, over the next, uh, I guess, three years, uh, the Nasdaq dropped 80 percent. It got all the way down to 800 and it stayed in that range for 15 years. It didn't hit a new high until 2015. And the whole and what happened to the mining sector? All that money that was chasing the Nasdaq uh, uh, bubble, you know, had to go somewhere. So it chose real assets uh, and that and a lot of that money went into real estate. A lot of that money went into gold and silver and miners. And uh, we had a 10 year bull market that started in 2002 that ended in 2012. And that was a pr pretty spectacular 10 year bull run. We saw silver go from five dollars to fifty dollars. We saw gold go from uh, 250 to uh, almost 1900. Uh, and if you look at. Um, those same types of moves, and if we're if we do see, in my opinion, a major market uh, uh, collapse uh, this year or next year, who knows when it's going to happen? But I think we're getting close to that happening. You know, that could be the beginning of a new run, and uh, um, this money will look for new homes to make money because money chases money, and people will make money uh, trying to make you know trade what's what's the big trade of the day. And I think the miners will become the next big trade of the day. You just don't want to pick a top or bottom because that's a, a fool, but fool who man's game to try to do that. When you and other CEOs in the mining community have uh, friendly chats, what are some of the topics that come up amongst the leaders in the mining industry? Well, you know, I think that, um, you know, we all talk about metal prices, you know, because it, particularly the silver guys. You know, silver, you know, I talked to all the CEOs. I've just met them all over the last couple of weeks and, you know, the various conferences I've gone to. And, uh, you know, there is a bewilderment or a surprise that silver is trading where it's trading. And uh, and uh, we kind of shake our head and uh, wonder why, why it is. And, uh, you know, when you have a metal like silver that's got the massive deficits uh, that have been going on for, I think, six years now. Uh, last year's deficit was in the order of 400 million ounces which is pretty crazy. You know, you have the miners producing 820 million ounces last year and, and, and the world consumed around 1.2 billion ounces, um, a, a third of that going to solar panels and electric cars. Um, and those two industries don't seem to be going backwards anytime soon. Uh, and, and, and also just pure electronics, computers, cell phones and, and the like, all the gadgets that we want as a human race. And now, we're even seeing renewed interest in nuclear uh, energy um, uh, from different governments around the world. And these nuclear plants need a lot of silver. And people don't think about you know, how much silver is in, in a nuclear plant. And unfortunately, the wars that are going on as well, you know, these missiles that are flying around also have silver in them. So there's a huge amount of silver being consumed, yet it's not showing up in price. It will. Um, it's just a matter of time again, as I said earlier in my previous comment. But um, you know, silver. You know, First Majestic is in a perfect spot, and uh, you know we're we're uh, doing reasonably well at these prices, but we're looking forward to better years ahead. The anticipated consumption in 2024 
is 1.4 billion ounces. And these are numbers that the Silver Institute have published and are available if people want to do their own research. The miners are have produced 820 million ounces a year, you know, for the last 10 years. You know, that number has not changed very much. It, it's fluctuated as a low of 780 million ounces to a high of 880 million ounces over that over that last 10 years. So last year 820, you know, call it whatever whatever you want for 2024. But the miners aren't going to be producing much more silver. You know, we need much much higher silver prices. We need triple digit silver in order to incentivize the miners to start mining more metal because at these current prices, there's just not enough money into it and not enough margin, pardon me. If you're enjoying this interview with Keith Newmeyer and I, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. And if you are looking for price exposure to gold, silver, and platinum while being fully backed by physical gold, silver, and platinum with some of the lowest prices and premiums around, I'd like to invite you to take a look at Silver Bullion's product, Stargram. Go to www.silverbullion.com.sg, go to the Precious Metals tab, and click on Stargram. We, we hear the word shortage, we hear the word deficit, and sometimes it's unclear whether the shortage is coming from the miners pulling silver out of the ground, or is the shortage coming from, let's say, uh, a production can't keep up with the demand. So a lot of times, uh, we, we're trying to figure out which is it on, on this end. Well, we already know that uh, demand out, outstrips supply from the miners by a very large degree. And the deficit is clear, it's published. It's uh, You can pull it up on the internet. There's a 400 million ounce deficit of silver in 2023. That's the public number. Now, where those ounces are coming from, you know, who knows? Like, you know, uh, China doesn't appear to be exporting silver. They, they appear to be importing. Uh, India appears to be importing silver as well. Um, uh, Russia, you know, with the, with the issues, um, uh, you know, uh, there, uh, they do have a large hoard of silver. I'm not sure if you remember that famous uh, photograph of Putin when he was in the vaults, uh, I guess about four or five years ago now, where he is holding a gold bar in his hand. And I zoomed in on that photograph because I was quite interested because, you know, it was quite a lot of gold that he was <laughs> uh, standing beside. And in the back wall, there's a bunch of pallets of silver. So, you know, it'd be interesting to know how many ounces there were there because, but, uh, you know, it, these are undisclosed ounces. Um, so possibly those ounces are coming into the market. Uh, uh, but yet it, it's not really that relevant because there is limited supply. You know, eventually deficits are met with higher price. You know, there there's silver coming from somewhere that is not countable uh, by the Silver Institute or any other agency who's following this information. But we do what we do as a, you know, we, we, we look at the data and, and, and we do shake our head to some degree, uh, but at the same time, you know, that def deficit will be closed and it only will be closed by higher, higher metal prices, higher, higher silver prices in this case. You know, Keith, the, the uses for silver are increasing, especially in the renewable energy sector, solar panels and paste. Uh, in the silver community, there's a strong belief that there's, let's call them actors or state actors where they buy products such as silver, maybe gold as well, directly from the mines for industrial use. Is this a standard business practice for, for mines? Not at all. No, that, that simply doesn't happen. Um, the, you know, if there might be a mine somewhere that may have a direct relationship with uh, an end user, uh, but it's very unusual. You you see that in the uh, like the, I've seen it in the cobalt business, um, uh, which is a pretty tiny business. I've also um, um, I forget the, the the mineral that's in aspirins. I just forget what it is. It's not calcium. It's um, I, 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 it could be magnesium. But there I, I know there in in that case, Bayer was uh, buying directly from a mine, you know, for the production of their aspirin. Um, this is, you know, this has been going on for decades. Um, but these are very kind of one-off, very unique situations. Um, uh, when, as a gold miner, a silver miner, a copper miner, even a lead and zinc miner, um, you know, these are world markets. They're liquid markets. Um, uh, you know, we want, you know, our shareholders want us to sell our metal at spot. You know, they, they don't want us to be doing special deals with, uh, you know, um, you know, commercial buyers who may want to be buying, you know, metal at a discount or signing long-term contracts at fixed prices or 
things like that, or, or you know, our shareholders wouldn't be very pleased with that. So no, we we take the risk of the market and uh, we deal with directly with the banks, uh, you know, to sell our metal. All right, some good insight there. Appreciate that, Keith. And from where you stand uh, in operating both gold and silver mines, how right or how wrong do you see the silver to gold ratio, which is a reflection of price? versus the physical supply ratio coming out of the ground. Yeah, I did a calculation the other day, actually. I think it was 91. Um, I don't know what it is today, but it's probably around that. Uh, yeah, it's very shocking. Um, you know, I've said, and you could even look at our corporate presentation, which is on our website, you know, firstmajestic.com, um, you know, where I say that we're mining as, a, as an industry, a, a mining industry, uh, seven to one. So you know, it's pretty amazing that for every one ounce of gold mined worldwide, there's only seven ounces of silver mined, yet you know, we're trading at 90 to one. Um, I don't, can't figure out why that is. You know, it's, it's related to the paper market, obviously. You know, the, 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 you know, the paper market trades something in the order of a billion ounces a day. So if, you know, if there's 320 trading days in a year, that means 320 billion ounces of paper silver trade every year and the miners only produce 820 million ounces so that's a lot of leverage that the banks have in the paper markets yeah one of the the many mines run by your companies the, the san dimos silver and gold mine is said to be the cornerstone asset in first majestic's portfolio it's the most important mine in our portfolio you know it produces something like 40 percent of our, our metal um so, uh, it, it's on an annualized basis. As, as San Dimas produces around uh, 13 million silver equivalent ounces, which uh, 50 percent of that is gold and 50 percent of that is silver, uh, in the form of dory bars, which is a pretty good place to be as a mining company. Uh, Santa Elena produces nine million ounces uh, of uh, silver equivalent uh, annually. Um, uh, last year it had a record year. Uh, we're expecting a similar year for that mine. In 2024, um, that's 60% gold, 40% silver. And then our smallest mine, the Lincoln Tata mine, uh, only produces about two and a half million ounces of silver, but that's 100% silver. Now, also dory bars. All, all three of our mines are dory producers. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask that question because I also wanted to get from, from your point of view, uh, after you average things out, what is the price per ounce for the cost of silver? Yeah, so all our all in sustaining costs are in this in the fifteen to sixteen dollar range, and uh, we have one troubled asset right now, uh, the Lincoln Tata mine, which is our smallest mine. It's running at pretty high cost right now because there's a water issue, and uh, we're one of the wells that are unfortunately collapsed, <clears throat> and we're now drilling for a new well to replace that one that was collapsed. So it's running at at pretty high prices, and it will probably for the next couple of quarters. So. You know, it's currently losing money, unfortunately. Uh, but you know, being such a small producer of 2.5 million ounces, you know, it's it's not affecting us, you know, uh, you know, too badly. Uh, you know, annual annualized, we're producing 23 million silver equivalent ounces. So you know, that mine produces, you know, just slightly, you know, around 10 percent. And overall, how are governments, or more particularly, let's say, world organizations, either helping or hurting the mining industry? I've looked at silver as a strategic metal for the last you know, decade. Uh, when I put First Majestic together, I put it together because of my love for silver and the, uh, and the fundamentals, you know, the supply demand fundamentals for, for the metal. So um, it's looking like the US government and the Canadian government and others, France and, and, and a couple other European governments are gonna put silver on the critical metals list. Um, so this is gonna help uh, miners because What's that going to do for, for the mining sector is it's going to allow the governments uh, to permit some silver mines more easily than they would otherwise possibly do. Because all of a sudden we now, governments wake up to the fact that we need these metals and, and without you know, these metals, we're not going to read our, reach our green um, uh, environmental targets that we're trying to reach. So um, that I think is very positive and you know, look for news on this. We put, a, we put out a news release just a couple of weeks ago. I would suggest you go to our website because there are 20 uh, uh, silver mining executives signed a, quite an important letter uh, to the Canadian government. And also that same letter has gone to the US government as well. So uh, we're expecting to see movement on that. Um, 
you know, but, you know, on the other side of the equation, you know, there are lots of positives, but, you know, mining is a complicated business. So it's something we're always having to monitor, you know, our ESG policies, we're always very focused on our CSR uh, policies as well. So, you know, we're always looking for ways to improve ourselves. You know, mining is a very important sector and we take it very seriously. Yeah, I was going to bring up that uh, strategic metal um, initiative where it looks like Canada is, is going to be one of the people taking the lead in this. But what do you think? Why did it take so long for, for this to happen? I mean, considering all the uses of silver and, and everything that silver is in. You know, it's governments. Uh, you know, I can't, I, I, you know, I saw if, if you look at the current list of strategic metals uh, published by the United States uh, a couple of years ago, um, uh, there's 50 metals on it. Half of them I've never heard of. You know, they're they're on the periodic table, of course, but you know, metals that most people would not even know what their what their name is, very, uh, despite you know, or even what they're used for. But and silver's not there. Uh, gold is not there, of course, but copper is there. Zinc is there. You know, there's a couple you know metals that we're all aware of that are on that list. But uh, you know, silver you know is looked at as the poor man's gold and. Uh, I've, you know, I, I put this company together 20 years ago. I've been saying for 20 years that this is a strategic metal necessary for, for the human race to do all the things that we want to do. And now, you know, some of the politicians around the world are finally catching up. Right. And I guess, you know, with, with these governments and that uh, ESG initiative that, that you mentioned, um, how has it been as far as, um, let's say, getting funding? Because I think a, a couple of years back, banks, you know, they were saying they, they don't really want to fund companies that, you know, aren't aren't ESG um, compliant, uh, maybe Aboriginal claims and rights uh, to certain lands. I mean, how do these affect also the, the mining industry? Well, it's something we have to be very aware of. Um, you know, as a miner, um, a mining company, I've been in this business, for, you know, as I said, for 35 years. So, you know, I wouldn't do business in certain jurisdictions, uh, you know, because, you know, land tenure is, is really the most important thing. Um, you know, permittability. Um, you know, you're not going to go buy an asset uh, or invest in an asset where it's never going to get permitted. Uh, uh, so there's certain regions around the world where it just doesn't make sense to invest. Uh, you know, places like Mexico, the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, parts of Europe, uh, um, you know, are, you know, are good places as a, for a mining company. To invest, if they're safe, um, uh, the legal system is 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 there to protect the businesses and also protect the communities and the governments and so on. Uh, so it's it's a framework that we're comfortable working in. But um, um, you know, I, I, you know, there's many parts of the world that I wouldn't risk uh, our capital on. Keith, could you tell us about your project, the first mint? We decided in early 2023. To construct our own mint, we we uh, built it in Nevada, the state of Nevada, and uh, I just and I, we put the people in place last summer. Uh, we started buying up all the equipment and did the construction. Took a while, took took longer than we thought it would have taken, but we actually poured our first bars last week. Uh, so uh, we'll be launching a new website. Uh, the name of the company is First Mint, which is a hundred percent owned subsidiary of First Mint Chesek Silver. Uh, so we're very excited about having that a new company uh, as part of our portfolio. I actually was looking at that and and I was curious about the the prices. The system's not automated. Um, uh, it will be automated. So when we when we launch the uh, new website, uh, it'll be under the first mint uh, banner. Um, it's just it should be we're hoping it's going to be launched by March 15th or at least that's what we're uh, planning on. Uh, so yeah, it'll be it'll actually float uh, with spot price. Last question here. Silver at 100. Still there, right? I mean, I'm rooting for that 100 to, to come over also, but you, you still see that 100 coming up? Well, you know, I'm the guy that came up with the triple digit silver phrase as well. So I've come up with many phrases, I guess, throughout my career. But, um, you know, the uh, and, and I've been laughed at, you know, and I've been criticized. Uh, I've had people write nasty things about me and uh, send me nasty messages and, you know, um, talking my own book and, and, and so on and so forth. But what people don't really realize, I think, is that um, I fell in love with silver because I felt that it was such an important, critical metal, uh, strategic metal. And uh, um, it's not like I got hired by a silver company. I formed this company from scratch, you know, because of my belief in silver. So 
I, you know, I, I called for $50 silver when I put the company together in 2002, and, and it was right. I was right. It took 10 years to get there, mind you. Um, I would have never predicted silver would have gone from 50 back to 12 uh, in the meantime. Um, you know, but we're now at 24 today, uh, which is obviously off its lows, but it still has not reached its old highs at $50. Um, I'm surprised it hasn't. You know, most other commodities have seen new highs in this cycle. Uh, Silver is, I think, the only commodity that has not reached a new high in the last decade. Um, so it will happen. Um, but I think, you know, once it gets through 50, which I'm sure a lot of people will be surprised when it happens. I won't be surprised. Um, but it's, it'll be on its way to triple digits. And it should be seven to one. Now, whether we ever see that, who knows? I, I don't have a crystal ball. And uh, but, you know, you just divide 2100 by seven, you come up, you know, with a potential silver price. I know it's a stupidly big number and, and I would never suggest that we would see such such numbers like that. But um, uh, but I do believe we will we will see triple digits. Right. Well, maybe they're a bit upset. The other guys anyway, because you're one of the visionaries in the industry, one of the more colorful people. And you're coining all the good terms before they have a chance to do it. So maybe, maybe that's part of it. But. Keith Newmar, before we wrap up, can you tell us how we can follow you on social media and about First Majestic? My Twitter is uh, just, you know, Keith underscore Newmeyer. Uh, I'm there. Uh, I don't put a lot of stuff out on social media, but I do put some odd things out uh, uh, that some people may be interested in. Uh, and, and of course, First Majestic uh, uh, has its own uh, Twitter account as well. And uh, always its website, uh, just firstmajestic.com. That's simple. All right, Keith, thank you for your time. And I, I'd like to check back in with you when the new strategic list comes out. Hopefully we'll see silver on it and we'll take a look at how the silver price is, is moving. Well, thanks uh, for your time as well, Patrick. It was good good chatting. That was Keith Newmeyer, CEO of First Majestic Silver Corp. Follow Keith, go to www.firstmajestic.com. If you like this video, please do subscribe, hit the thumbs up, and share all are greatly appreciated audio only versions of this interview can be found on itunes and spotify